I just received uh, the green light from the recipient of the congressional citation, uh, Colonel Reserves Eitan Azani and Dr. Eitan Azani, uh, to begin today's uh, proceedings. Thank you, Colonel, and, uh, and citation recipient. Uh, the second thing that I would like to do ceremonially here, uh, as we begin this uh, very festive workshop, probably the most festive workshop we've had in the history of ICT, is I see to my left, well, she was here. Ah, here, there she is. I see a baroness in the audience. And I see a commissioner of police from London. So I, you, you, I ha we ha on, on behalf of Israel, that used to once be part of the British mandate, okay, and myself, who was born in London, okay, I congratulate you on Queen Elizabeth okay. finally taking over, winning the Guinness Book of Records for the most years ruled by any queen. She defeated Queen Victoria, I think, this morning. So congratulations to our British friends. And secondly, I, I'm glad to see uh, Professor Ganor also um, in, in the audience uh, together with all of us here. Well, it's, it's very festive. I don't even know how to begin this. Um, frequently, Stephen makes me speechless, and other times not, actually. <laughs> sometimes I'm speechless, but sometimes it gets me going, where I'm burning calories li like a madman. So let's begin with this. I think Stephen is an American sabra. An American sabra. You know, a sabra is someone born in Israel. They say they're a little rough on the outside, but they're extremely sensitive and humane on the inside. And so, the first time I met Stephen, he was like a tough businessman. He was, uh, this must have been 12 years ago, in 2003. What is ICT? Is it serious? Is it not serious? Why is there a spelling mistake here? Why didn't we send the invitation on time? What's going on here and there? Or it could have been five minutes before Shabbat comes in. Exactly what room, okay, is the workshop on cyber terrorism on the next Tuesday? But that's because Stephen is a very, very, very committed individual. And he's been in, in contact with us uh, for the last 12 years. And he's kept us also where we, where we need to be. And he's consistently been a supporter of, uh, of ICT and IDC. And in fact, I, I've got to tell you uh, that, uh, and I guess this must be the reason why it's 94 degrees Fahrenheit outside <laughs> and 80 degrees and, and 80 humidity. Someone is telling us something about this. It's, in Judaism, we call it a tikkun. It's a tikkun. Okay, so, so basically, I've got to share with you an email which Stephen sent me in 2003, okay, unrehearsed, okay? This is why I love being Jewish, he says. We have never been better off. It's only TV and the media that make people think that the end of the world is coming. Only 60 years ago, they were leading Jews to their death like sheep to the slaughter. No country, no army, 55 years ago. Seven Arab countries declared war on the small Jewish state, only a few hours old. We were 650,000 Jews against the rest of the Arab world. No IDF, no mighty air force, just tough people with nowhere to go. Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, Libya, Saudi Arabia attacked all at once. The country the United Nations gave us was 65% desert. The country started from scratch. 35 years ago, we fought the three strongest armies in the Middle East. We fought against different coalitions of Arab countries with modern armies and masses of Soviet Russian weapons, and we still won. We have today a country, an army, a strong air force, a strong high-tech economy. I won't read all of this, okay? But he continues, who the hell is Mr. Arafat to make me scared, says Stephen Stern. To make me terrified? You make me laugh. Take it easy, folks. We will overcome. The present enemies, too. The nation from the Bible, from the slavery in Egypt, we are still here, speaking the same language, right here, right now. So sorry for not worrying, not bitching, not crying, not being scared. Things are okay over here. They certainly could be better. Don't fall for the media junk. They won't tell you that there are festivals going on, that people keep on living, 
that people are going out, that people are seeing friends, etc., etc., etc. That's what Stephen sent me in 2003. I've got the proof right here. He sent me a whole bunch of other things too, Stephen. But, but I chose this. It, it was at the very beginning. And I think it says something about you, your personality, and, and, and your commitment. And uh, your charming first lady, Bonnie, grabbed a hold of me in New York and said, you know, Stephen never asks for anything, okay? Stephen never demands anything. Stephen doesn't ask for his name to be up in lights, okay? Is there something modest that we can do, that we can think about? And so the first thing is that the love of Stephen's life is this subject, cyber terrorism. And secondly, I said, well, there's going to be unveiling of a plaque in front of the office of uh, Professor Bosganor. The offices of Professor Bosganor are going to be named the Stephen Eastern offices. I said to myself, every VIP that comes to this campus that wants to speak about counterterrorism will now walk by Stephen Eastern in perpetuity. And that's what we modestly decided to do with the blessings of Professor uh, Uriel Reichman, with the blessings of uh, Professor Ganor, who when you met Professor Ganor, was just a young PhD who uh, sometimes had to fight the politics of Israeli academia to survive. And now he's the dean of the Louder School and continues to head ICT and continues to make this conference the Davos of counterterrorism um, around the world. And so, Stephen, you invested well in 2003. Your investment was a good investment. It was a startup. We'll make the exit when we have peace in the Middle East and Isaiah comes back. Okay? So the floor is yours, Stephen. tell you one thing, my comments this morning are much shorter than that email Jonathan read to you. Oh. Um, I am very excited to be here today and proud to be associated with the ICT, its people and its cutting edge work. I believe that the topic of cyber terrorism is not only topical today, but one of the greatest threats that faces our nation. Many decades ago, when I started to be concerned about national security, we lived in a bipolar world. It was who had more and better tanks, submarines, ICBMs, and intercontinental bombers. When the wall came down, the world evolved into a bipolar state. The, the previous threats, which were very costly, became regional and much cheaper. First, kidnappings predominated. Then physical terror. It evolved into internet terror and then the current state of cyber terror. Boaz Ganor named this conference the shifting sands of terrorism. I wanted to be what I, I wanted to sponsor what I consider to be the leading edge of that threat. This conference brings together the finest minds in a format that provides for a robust and in-depth discussion of this insidious threat. It is my hope as a participant and supporter that this most important institution continue its work to bring attention to and fight cyber terrorism and its growth. Thank you. Short and sweet. I always have to get the last word in. Okay. Uh, after this uh, first Stephen Eastern workshop on cyberterrorism, which in perpetuity is going to be named for Stephen Eastern, which is great because, uh, in, I mean, I hope we don't need a workshop like this in 30 years from now. But just in case we do, okay, it's still going to be called the Stephen Eastern one. Okay. And uh, Professor Garnor will be speaking. Uh, at the end of this workshop, outside, when we raise a toast for Stephen before we unveil the plaque, we divided it up that way. And now you guys didn't come here to hear me. Right, Errol? Right. 
All right. So uh, that's it. <coughs> the recipient of the congressional citation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, hi everybody. We want to uh, start our uh, presentation today regarding the uh, uh, cyber issues, cyber terror and cyber communication. And what we are uh, going to do within these uh, uh, discussions, I will uh, uh, discuss in some minutes who are the people that are uh, uh, working here uh, in, in the panel itself. What we are uh, going to do, what are the main issues and the main subject that we will discuss. And then we will present our uh, main topics. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you will have the ability to ask uh, a question. Uh, the, the first speaker, it will be me. I will start with the current trend. We will build the uh, a presentation in a way that we will discuss the threat. We will discuss the response from the national level and from the international level. And then we will discuss technology. This is the way that we establish and we build this kind of uh, a, a panel. And I, I'm going to discuss the story of the use of the Internet for the terrorist organization in, two, in three different uh, layers. One is operation, second is defensive, third is offensive uh, issues. Uh, after me, it will be the ambassador that will uh, discuss the jihadi narratives on social media, forum, and chat. And chat. This is the Ambassador Alberto Fernandez, uh, who is the Vice President of the Middle East Media Research Institute memory and a former coordinator for the Strategic Counterterrorism Communication in U.S. Department of State in the United States of America. The next speaker that will describe the uh, national uh, response, uh, national response to cyber terror and cyber crime uh, from policy to application it will be the Baroness. Uh, uh, the Baroness Pauline uh, Neville Jones, former Minister of State for Security and Counterterrorism in the United Kingdom. Afterward, it will be a uh, discussion about the national response to cyber fraud linked to terrorism, uh, terrorist funding. It will be the Commissioner Lapad. This is the Commissioner of City of London Police, United Kingdom, and he will discuss it from uh, this uh, a, a concept. Next, it will be uh, the story of the international response to cyber terror, uh, cyber security, and cyber terrorism, international law perspective. My friend, uh, Dvora uh, Hausen Curiel, uh, associate from the International Institute of Counterterrorism at IDC uh, Ertelia. And the last speaker will be Professor Avram Wagner, that he will describe the technology technological trend and development uh, for countering cyber threat. This will be a, our uh, workshop, and I want to discuss, to start to discuss my story. If I uh, uh, in a position of uh, trying to uh, uh, divide and to explain what are the areas and the jihadi activities and the entities that are operating within the areas of cyber terror, I can divide it into four different tier of operation. Propaganda, operations, defense, and offense. Because the jihadists use the internet for everything, from the level of the propaganda to the level of the operation, and then a defense and offense for their uh, operation themselves. <laughs> Within the propaganda itself, what we saw during the years, the uh, evolution of the DAWA operation from the classic way of DAWA operation in the real world into the internet arena. We see the recruitment measures delivered from the real world into the, inter into the internet arena. We see the ideology that disseminated in these two areas. We see the jihadi message that shapes into new technology that we face today, what we call social networks. And we see also the jihadi news. If we need specific news from different areas around the world, you can find it today by Twitter, by uh, the jihadists that using all these social networks to deliver their messages. Within the operation itself, we are describing global jihadists that are operating uh, a, always around the world. Everything that connects to this, their operation, you can find it on the, via the internet. 
You can find the strategy of this organization. You, you can find the training manual of this organization. They gather intelligence by using the platform of the internet, the fundraising, the changes. We see changes with the fundraising uh, uh, issues within the jihad when we, they enter more and more inside these uh, 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 issues. And we see the level of communication between themselves. Regarding defense and offense, what we can say in the world of cyber uh, terror, that it, within the defense and offense, we have two different levels. One, we call it organizational level, and second, we call it personal level, because the two of them need to operate within this world of defense and offense. And within the defense it, and offense itself, we can say very clearly that there are two different layers. One is the software, <coughs> and second is the knowledge how to use this software and how to uh, build things within their uh, operation. And the last component within our discussion, these are the entities. What we find out during the years, and specifically during the last years, more and more entities that were uh, established within this field of uh, counterterrorism. The Electronic Jihad Battalion, the Electronic Jihad Army, Cyber Caliphate, uh, Jihadist Internet, Hacking Brigade, hackers, and we see more and more entities that enter into this field. Meaning if you see the way that the jihadi group use the Internet today, you can find out that the Internet become a crucial component within the jihadi arena. Crucial component. And it's not by coincidence they change it from the word cyber terror into the word electronic jihad. Meaning because these uh, structures can help them to carry out their jihad. So they have the religious justification that enable them to call it electronic jihad. And if I try to describe only in very short descriptions the evolution that we face within this field of electronic jihad or cyber, I can say from the point of view of the jihadist group, what we started, or what they started from the beginning, it was the media committee. Every jihadic organization, every jihadi leader had a media committee, and through the media committee, the information, the messages of the leadership delivered to the uh, audience in different platforms. In the previous world, it was by uh, a radio, internet, and other uh, components, television and other issues. But this jihadi uh, media committee had four sub-bodies uh, uh, that operated under some kind of supervision of this committee. One is the media outlet. The, this media outlet was the production center, meaning you have the messages, you have the speeches, you have the interviews delivered by the media outlet, totally control, controlled by the leadership because the leaders are a, totally controlled these media outlets. The second component, it was the jihadi website. If you want to deliver your messages, you have the media outlet that produce the message, and then you, this message can be delivered by the jihadi uh, website themselves. So it, jihadi website was uh, controlled by leadership, edited, and fully managed. The next generation that we find within this group was the jihadi forums, because people need to talk between themselves. So they uh, give them the ability to talk between themselves in chat room. In this situation of jihadi forum, the were organizational control, but they were half managed because they have a manager of every chat room, but they were not totally managed because people posted what they want to post it. The main problem of this uh, uh, a jihadi forum that they were closed. To enter a jihadi forum, you need a, plat you need a password. So it's, uh, it convinced the people that are convinced and convinced the people that are from security agencies that are operating within the jihadi forum. So they need to change a little bit the system. How they change the system? They change the system by publishing digital magazine. Because digital magazine were controlled, digital magazine were open to everything, and digital magazine have them the ability even to recruit people via the digital magazine. Contact us via the digital magazine. This is the, the ability of this organization to approach uh, a, a lot of people around uh, the world. But the last and most important development within this field was the social network. When the jihadi social network uh, 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 started, specifically ISIS delivered these messages even uh, uh, more uh, higher than the others, we uh, enter into decentralized messages. A message that on one hand carried out by organization themselves, meaning the headquarters, 
but there are a lot of messages that carried out by people on the ground. Nobody controlled them. It was decentralized. It was open to everyone. It was unedited, but it was very flexible. The reason it was very flexible is that everyone can recruit everyone. Everyone can ask for money for his organization. It's easy access also for the people. And they, within this uh, social network, they had huge potential audience. This is one of the reasons that you can reach everybody uh, uh, in uh, the Western countries and other places around the world by using this uh, uh, issue. This is a, a something that we need to uh, uh, bear in our mind. So what you can see during the last years, more and more information that uh, uh, directed to the lone wolf. Meaning, here it is the link. We give you the link for everything that you want. Manual training, combat, uh, a, a, a assault, or what you want. Explosive, whatever you want. You can take it from the internet via the uh, social network uh, information. We can give you information about how to plan. You just see how the ACAP, the Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, sharing information of one of the attacks that they were carried out in, uh, in Yemen against headquarters. Here is the information. This is the planning cycle. You can uh, take from it. You can learn from it. And you can uh, implement it in uh, other areas. And there is also a huge changes during the last uh, two years, specifically the last year, within the electronic jihad and fundraising. They change the fundraising, it transformed from the classic method to the fundraising uh, via digital channel. We see the uh, a story of the electronic jihad and fundraising transformed from control channels of fundraising, meaning website. Here is my account. I am a charity. This is the bank account of the charity and the money need from these issues. It's transformed to personal decentralized fundraising channel. I'm a jihadist. I want to go to the theaters of jihad in Syria. Please donate me some uh, money. Here is my, uh, the link to uh, uh, the donation. And we see also an increase of the amount of uh, credit card fraud, uh, phishing uh, scams, and data breaching. Here it is how the system works. You see different uh, uh, layers. One, organizational entities. Second, independent cells or individuals. The way that they are working today within this world. We request for donation. I request for donation. Where is the request for donation? On the internet. What is the channel? One channel, I give you electronic tools. You can send money through PayPal. You can send money through Cashew. You. you can send money through prepaid. Second channel that I give you, you can send money to my digital wallet, Bitcoin. You can do it in the real world and you can do it in the dark name. I give you the numbers of the Bitcoin. And the last component within these uh, uh, different changes, I'll give you the account, I'll give you the financial delivery channels. Uh, uh, all of them are uh, uh, safe because I have the defensive capabilities to deal with it. If they are encrypted, please send me the money. And when you go to the real world, you can see here one an example, request from donation from uh, a group that called Anonymous uh, uh, Kavkaz. They request for donation and they ask the people to donate money through PayPal. Please deliver us the money through paper. We give you the uh, issue, send us the money, and there is the way. You don't need to meet me. You don't need to know who am I. Just send me the money. Another example that give you another way of understanding about this kind of uh, delivering money, request for donation. You see a very nice poster. I will give you a phone number. You see different phone numbers. Please send money through this phone number that is a uh, phone number that based on uh, uh, a other software called Telegram. It's uh, something that you can hide your uh, entity. Send me this money. Believe me, it's a very safe and secure. Send me this money to the organization itself. We see it more and more within the Internet that uh, uh, they, they, they try to uh, run these kind of uh, uh, issues. On the other side, when they ask money, they said, OK, here is my poster. This is the sum of the money that uh, cost me to buy you know, this kind of weapon. You want to help me? Please donate money for this uh, weapon. We give you the ability to donate money, but we tell you, believe me, we have a safe channel for this kind of donation. You know, because people ask them, it is really safe. 
to send these kind of money? It is really safe. They said, we find the safe uh, uh, a channel and please uh, send us money. Not through official channels. We don't want official channels. We, don't, we want safe channels. So you can find other uh, uh, different uh, uh, entities, like uh, in this uh, example that you have here, uh, uh, delivering money through Cashew, another way of uh, uh, changing and covering the people that deliver the money. In this uh, uh, example, the Mad Gaza sends secure channels to their audience, please donate me money, here is the uh, Cashew capabilities. We give you all the ability and the information to do it, we just want from you $2,500. We accept it through the cash you are a, a channel. Please send us this uh, a information. So you can see that within this kind of uh, money transfer, everything becomes digital. The Islamic State, even more sophisticated. Islamic State publish uh, a post in the internet, ask people to donate money through Bitcoin uh, a numbers. So you have the Bitcoin numbers of the Islamic State. You see here is uh, electronic wallet. Here it is my Bitcoin number. Please deliver money to this uh, a wallet. Nobody really will be able to uh, a, have an access to your uh, operation. On the other side, they use the darknet. We spend a lot of effort to find information about jihadists in the darknet. It's very difficult, believe me. It's very difficult. There is no real way to find a system that enable you to enter into the darknet. But from time to time, you will find some connections between the darknet area and between the uh, uh, open world area. Just say, for instance, Cyber Caliphate uh, uh, through the, uh, 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 <coughs> the, the social network sent his uh, uh, audience to a URL in the darknet. How you know that this is in the darknet? Dot union. Meaning he send you through the, he send you to the darknet itself, meaning you have, you have the understanding that the jihadist also operated inside the uh, darknet itself. Defense, this was the story of uh, a fundraising, defense. The working assumption of every terrorist organization that are dealing with the internet, that the internet is under attack and must be protected. They understand how that they are real exposed by the uh, uh, international community, specifically security agencies. So they uh, promoted the protection over the internet in two different arenas, group level and personal level. They use it by different uh, a, a software and knowledge that disseminated to uh, a different groups uh, within the uh, a, a jihadi uh, forums and jihadi website. What we can say regarding the defensive software that in the last years, in the previous years, the jihadists uh, uh, published a, a product in Arabic that this product, they use it for software operations. This product, the w most well-known product of the jihadists called Asrar al-Mujahideen 2. Okay, and they have, you know, like when you have uh, uh, a new software, you have bugs and you need to fix it. And they uh, operate uh, the Asrar al-Mujahideen too, that is a product of uh, Al-Qaeda. But what we see during the last year more and more, that they use on-the-shelf products. They don't publish a new product, they use on-the-shelf products. And because they have the social network capabilities, you will find out that these on-the-shelf products disseminated via the uh, uh, a social network of these organizations. For, for instance, we have here uh, a, a product for the Android uh, a mobiles. You have product for Mac. You have a product for using Tor. You have product of uh, CyberGhost uh, software. You have an encryption software. These, all of them are on the shelf software, meaning it can, you can uh, buy it or find it via the internet. What we also find out that within the social network, they use more and more other uh, pro encrypted products. Uh, some of it was uh, uh, SourcePot, that this is uh, an encrypted product that use all over the world. And they, uh, you can see through the discussion between themselves that they said, OK, if you want to contact me, please contact me this, through this encrypted product. So you have the uh, SourcePot, one of it. The second encrypted product that they use, this is Kik encrypted product or weaker encrypted product. 
meaning they are really well uh, are aware to the uh, 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 the security agencies uh, measures to enter inside uh, uh, their uh, uh, system. So you can find out more and more information about uh, a product that they use or they need to defend their uh, capabilities. The last component within my discussion, uh, this is the story of uh, offense. The other groups carried out an offensive attack. Jihadi groups today establish more and more small uh, hackers unit. Some of them are part of the system. Some of them are not part of the system, just followers. So we can see, very, we can highlight it very quickly and say that within the jihadi groups, we have a high motivation to carry out uh, a, a offensive attack on the uh, internet platform. We have learning curve within these organizations because we see that they learn all the time. The capabilities of the jihadi groups this year, last year, what we when we analyzed the capability, we said the capability was it was low capability. We think this year that the capability is low plus capability, and we will describe why later on. There is a cooperation between the jihadi groups. There is a cooperation between the jihadi groups and the state, specifically when it comes to the story of state-sponsored terror like Iran and Hezbollah. And there is cooperation between jihadi groups and criminal activists within this field. So we can say in short time estimation, we can say regarding the jihadi group that we have ongoing changes, an increase in the level of the threat. It's not just law, because we need to understand that the enemy uh, learn more and more about these kinds of uh, uh, operation within the uh, 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 internet uh, arena. So if I can highlight what I uh, uh, just said regarding offensive, we can say that there is increase in the level of the knowledge in cyber attack. Some of it based on foreign fighters, that they are really uh, expert within this field of the internet. And when you have these kinds of foreign fighters, it enables you to have more uh, knowledge about these issues. There is more availability of cyber tools for free online. I can uh, tell you that there is, uh, uh, a, was a story about uh, a, a group, a company that was, uh, a, some of their product that was, that was sold to uh, a security agencies, police all over the world, an Italian company, the information about this Italian company, uh, a, the tools that this Italian company promoted was on the internet, meaning increased possibility of proliferation of vast cyber tool to the jihadi organization and activist and uh, advocate. There is the ability to move data. Uh, we find some, you know, weak points within these people that, uh, because it came from the foreign fighters, weak points of people that work in IT company and then they were fired from the IT company, they deliver some of their information <laughs> messages to this uh, a group. And we can also say that there is availability of a salt product in the market itself. Malware and means of attack for DDoS platform, reasonable price, you know, the uh, GRDs can uh, hire uh, uh, international criminal uh, subcontractors and they can carry out this kind of operation without very, a lot of problems. And there is an increase in attack of, uh, and in the level of the attack in 2015, uh, uh, some of it to, from tens to hundreds, we don't know yet to uh, uh, divide what are the specific attacks that were carried out by uh, jihadist groups, but it looks like that there is an increasing uh, uh, trend. Regarding the offense, what we can say, we can, we can say also that there is emergence of a new the offensive organization within the uh, jihadi forums, within the jihadi arena. Some of them are uh, a, a semi-organization group, organized group. Some of them are decentralized personnel. Some of them are part of the uh, uh, organization itself. Some of them are operating outside the organization. On another case, we can say that there is an increase in the sophistication of the attack, specifically by ISIS. And I think that one of the most important case studies, this is the study of the uh, 
Raqqa is being slaughtered uh, silently. The story of this uh, organization that operated under the ISIS areas, that ISIS, through using of social engineering operation, understood exactly and sent information and sent links to the people that operate on the ground after he carried out surveillance, take them and kill them. Meaning he used this kind of what we called in the attack uh, or in the offensive arenas, the social uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, operations, and carried out a spear phishing attack. Uh, this is uh, a very uh, important concept of a very new concept that used by the jihadists, spear phishing attack specifically on the, on the target that he want uh, uh, to attack itself. Multiple targets, what are the targets of these groups? We have multiple targets, no common denominators, government, banks, media website, transportation, personal data, medical data, military, private companies. Uh, in most cases, I can say that the focus is on SME, small, medium enterprise, because this is our one of our main weak points. We can say that they are carried out external and internal target. They attack external and internal target, meaning ISIS, the target that are inside the territory that under his control and external target. They have, uh, uh, in some cases, organizational direction. In some cases, as we mentioned before, when you are living in the world of social network, everything can operate by people without any connection to the uh, headquarters, and I hope that you discuss it in more uh, detail. And they use social media uh, to convey information uh, uh, during these, uh, including targets, uh, uh, during their uh, operation itself. I thought that I took more many times, so I finished my uh, presentation in two uh, uh, last slides. One, you can see here the pictures of uh, newcomers to our uh, arenas of uh, a dedicated organizational and supporter cyber unit. You have the cyber caliphate in different entities. Cyber caliphate published a lot of information about their uh, people. You have the ISIS hacking division. You have the Anon Ghost. Unidentified, uh, it, they, they are super supporters of ISIS, they are supporters of Al Qaeda Central. They are operating based on their own uh, agenda. You have Qaeda Al Jihad, Electronia, meaning the uh, cyber uh, group of uh, 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 Al Qaeda Central, and you will have also other supporters that are operating within this field. Okay. Every year, what we try to show is the level of the threat that was carried out by the jihadist group. What is the level of the threat that we can say within the world of uh, a, a cyber uh, attack? And we said always that the level of the threat is connected to motivation plus capability, multiple frequency of the attack. And if you want to put all the actors in one place, on one uh, area, you can say that state has high capability, but state involved in attack only when they are in war, at war. So they are not on the line of the attack. This is the level, the line of the attack. We have uh, a, a sponsored terrorist by the state. They are the high, in the higher position of this area because they have the knowledge, and they carried out an attack, like Hezbollah, like other uh, organizations that sponsored by the attack. We have international criminals. That they have the knowledge and they are very high in this level of uh, uh, attacking uh, other issues. On the other place, you have hackers and criminals, and they are really very low capability. High, they, they try to attack, but they are very low capability. The terrorists last year were here. This year, they are jumped here. And if they have the knowledge and they are learning, they will be here. Meaning this is one of the reasons why we are analyzing all the time the development within this group. Because they are learning all the time and what they want to achieve at the end of the day is to cause destruction. They are not in this place yet, but they want to cause destruction. And within this happy note, I finished my part of the discussion and I invited my friend, the ambassador, to say his word. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. This is something I do 
on purpose on the spur of the moment because I want to uh, illustrate a point. So let's see if... Okay, that's enough. Um, what's the point I seek to explain? Um, um, I'll get to what this means, but um, in fact, I'll, maybe I'll start with this. What I did is I wanted to see in a very kind of spontaneous way how difficult or how easy it is to find uh, ISIS propaganda on the internet, on YouTube specifically. Uh, and this is a Nasheed. This is a ISIS uh, hymn or song, um, which has its own style, its own subculture. It's one of the most famous ones, Daulatin al Mansura, Our State is Victorious. Uh, when I went on YouTube to find it, to find it I got uh, five versions of it on the first page. I didn't even go to the second page. And they were the, you know, the, the information on the video were, uh, was in English. There was one in, uh, obviously, in Arabic. There was one in Chechen. And there was one, strangely enough, in the first page in uh, Danish. The Danish one had 100,000 views. Uh, they've been up for at least a couple of years. Uh, and they tended to have 30, 40, 50,000 views, each one of them. Uh, and we'll get to the Anashid, but uh, the interesting thing about the music, ISIS music videos, or even the songs, is that they're often embedded in larger collections of Islamist or Salaf Salafi uh, music compilations. So, in other words, you can go on YouTube and you can say, I'm going to listen to Anashid, right, to this... Uh, uh, Salafi allowed songs which do not have musical instruments, which are basically a man singing with battle noise and other stuff. Um, and you go to Anashid and you have a, you know, a cleric singing about religion, about love, or about whatever. But within it, you'll have actually ISIS written songs as part of the music collection. Um, I, I just do that to show kind of the ubiquitous nature of the propaganda threat we, we face. You know, in 2005, Ayman al-Zawahiri, the now head of uh, al-Qaeda at the time, the deputy, uh, sent a famous letter to uh, the head of al-Qaeda in Iraq, which eventually became the Islamic State, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, and it's the famous letter where he said, um, where he chided him for being too brutal in, in, in beheadings and too brutal in violence, and he used that famous phrase, for we are in a battle, and media is more than half the battle. Al-alam akthar min nafs al This is a famous phrase of Zawahiri. Uh, Zawahiri doesn't seem to have put it into effect, but Zarqawi definitely did. And one can say that if you look at, certainly at the narrative, if you look at, certainly at the uh, um, um, application of propaganda today by jihadist groups, and specifically by Al-Qaeda and ISIS, you know, Al-Qaeda is your grandfather using the internet. Um, some of the more advanced, uh, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Aitan mentioned it, uh, uh, some of the more advanced parts of Al-Qaeda in, uh, in, in this realm, like Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, was very much an intermediate stage of development. Of course, they're the ones with Inspire Magazine, they're the ones with, before the rise of the Islamic State, they were the ones actually that were the leaders in many ways in social media. And you could say that AQAP was in its heyday, at its height, especially when it had its safe havens in Yemen, 
which it's getting again as a result of the war in Yemen, uh, was like you using the internet. Uh, and of course, ISIS is like your, your children, if your children are particularly savvy and aggressive and subversive on social media, that's ISIS using, uh, using uh, 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 social media to get its message out. This didn't happen um, overnight, but it happened relatively quickly. If you go back to as recently as 2011, 2012, ISIS propaganda is domestic. What do I mean by that? Uh, it wasn't ISIS. Of course, it was the Islamic State of Iraq. Um, and as recently as 2011, 2012, the propaganda of the Islamic State was internally focused, focused on Iraq, um, not that polished. It became more polished over time. Uh, focused on domestic issues, corruption in Iraq, the mistreatment of prisoners, um, the hypocrisy of political leaders, uh, very in-house, very local, very domestic. 2013 is the key year that changes the mix in terrorist use of social media, where ISIS rewrites the school, rewrites the, 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 the books, on how to do all this. Three, thing hap three things happened in 2013 that impact ISIS and that impact the world that we live in in social media and the world we live in in, in, uh, in uh, cyber terrorism. In 2013, the three elements that happen is, number one, the Islamic State's encounter with Syria. It is Syria, the reality of Syria, the reality of Syria as the first social media war, the first Twitter war. It provides a qualitative jump in the way that, that, that the Islamic State is doing media. We don't know if it was that they met you know, Ahmed Abu Samra somewhere in northern Syria or, or you know, what was the specific event or events that happened, but clearly Syria, and we'll get to Syria as part of the message, it's the encounter with Syria that provided this qualitative leap for, for, for ISIS. The second thing that happens is the embrace of Twitter. Now, terrorist groups had used Twitter before. A Shabab in Somalia had been an early adopter of Twitter, and Hamas and Hezbollah had heavily used Twitter as well, uh, compared to some of the Al-Qaeda groups, uh, which, as Dr. Etan said, were focused usually traditionally on the idea of the, you know, the password-protected sites. Um, but the Islamic State embraces Twitter in 2013 in a big way. There's a variety of explanations for it. One of, them, of or, uh, one of them, of course, is that the password protected sites were controlled by Al Qaeda. And the relationship between Al Qaeda and the Islamic State had always been, have always been uneasy. Um, so that more and more, as the rift between Al Qaeda and the Islamic State grew, the Islamic State found itself you know, in a much more precarious position in using the password protected sites. And it, it, it made a virtue out of a, of a problem it has, that it surrendered control. Password protected sites are all about control, about controlling the message, and embrace the chaos. They embrace the possibility of the broad brush approach that Twitter provides. The third thing that, that ISIS uh, began to do in 2013 is the embracing of Western languages. Again, terrorist propaganda in Western languages is not a new thing, and certainly, as I said, Inspire is a particular example. A Shabab had also done a lot of messaging in English. Uh, AQI, AQIM in North Africa obviously had a French component. But they began to produce not just the online magazine like, uh, like um, AQAP had done, but the Islamic State began to produce a, a wide range of material uh, from 2013 on in the English language. They piggybacked on two phenomenons that were already in existence to create this network that we see today. Number one, as I said, the reality of Syria as the first social media war was a tremendous impact. Syria was already in covering the war. Twitter, the use of handheld uh, uh, you know, phones to take pictures of battles or of killings and all of that stuff. That was something that was already well ingrained in the first years in 2011, 12, and, and beyond as, as that war was covered. The, the second thing which they embraced was something which has been happening, which is not terrorism, 
uh, but I like to call it the antechamber of terrorism, the foyer of terrorism, which is the rise of virtual Salafism as an online subculture. This is particularly true in the West, in Western languages. I don't mean to say Salafism equals terrorism, but as, you know, I forget what's, what's the, the phrase we say, uh, not all Salafis are terrorists, but certainly if you talk about Al-Qaeda and ISIS, Al-Qaeda and ISIS are Salafis. Um, so there is a connection there, and there was, especially in the West, an embrace of social media by Western Salafi Muslims, and in the Middle East as well, as an alternate to on-the-ground reality. You're locked out of the mosque because the mosques are controlled by a moderate or a liberal. You're locked out of institutions controlled by the state, whether a Western state or a Middle Eastern state. But there's a virtual mosque. There's a virtual community. There's a virtual library uh, that you can access, which, which becomes a community. And indeed, this feeds into that part of the ISIS uh, uh, juggernaut, which is what we call the fanboy phenomenon, what ISIS sometimes calls uh, Fursan al-Tahmil, the knights of the uploading, the volunteers that take what ISIS produces and then magnify it, amplify it 25 times, 50 times, 100 times in, in, on Twitter accounts and social media um, sites. So the ISIS juggernaut has these two parts. It has the official part and it has the volunteer part. The official part is well known, you know, there are the, 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 the media houses, the, the media committees, Al-Furqan, Al-Ittisam, the Al-Hayat Media Center, which does uh, uh, Western language, especially English language media, the Ajnad Production House, which does music like the one I played. Ironically, for an organization that forbids musical instruments, they actually have a very successful musical production company, as it were. Uh, that produces very catchy uh, songs, uh, mostly in Arabic, but also sometimes in uh, German. There are several examples in German, more than in English. Um, and then you have, at, at, that's at the, at the institutional level. Below that, you have media committees in, in every state, and you see them competing with each other. And so you see some of the more prolific media committees, Wilayat uh, Al Khair, which is Deir Ezzor, or Nineveh, which is Mosul, or Raqqa, competing with each other and, and sometimes having a different, a different take, a different spin. So there are, for example, the Nineveh committee, I don't know what's wrong with them. They often tend to have some very sadistic material that they produce. Welayat uh, al-Khair, Der Zor, is a leader in producing the life is normal or life is good under the caliphate videos. And they produce a lot of videos about you know, people raising camels, or a guy paying his taxes, or that kind of, of, of stuff. So, so that's, the, that's the, uh, the infrastructure. As far as the message is concerned, the ISIS message, the ISIS narrative has, has developed over time, but has stabilized, certainly, since the um, establishment of the caliphate. Before the caliphate, I often describe it as made up of three or four elements to reduce, try to reduce it as simply as possible. Number one, it's about an emergency. The Muslims are being killed, mostly in Syria, right? The importance of Syria and that narrative. That's what attracted 20,000 foreign fighters. These 20,000 foreign fighters didn't go to Yemen, they didn't go to Afghanistan, they didn't go, they went to Syria because the image, the idea that this was an unjust, awful, terrible thing that was happening was seductive, was powerful. So emergency, and then you can do something about it, what people call personal agency. As in the uh, June 2014 video, uh, There's No Life Without Jihad, which fe featured English language jihadists, especially UK jihadists, uh, like some of the ones that were uh, killed this week, uh, you know, why be on the sidelines in this golden time? This is the time to be part of the struggle. The Muslims are suffering. There's something new coming. Uh, you want to be part of this. So personal agency. And done in a way which is very Western, very uh, modern. One of the words I hate to, that people describe when they talk about ISIS or they talk about jihadists is medieval. Actually, if you study medieval Islam, medieval Islam was a much more liberal 
tolerant and open society than the society that the Islamists of today preach. Um, this is a very 21st century thing. It's about me talking to you. It's about your experience. That's why when you see the video of the jihadists, of the ISIS guy, it's about their personal testimony. I once was lost, and now I'm found. I was into drugs. Now I'm on the straight path. It's about the narcissistic individual nature of the personal experience. Not some old cleric describing things, but about me, my feelings, my experience. It's what scholars have called the democratization of religious knowledge, which is basically, you know, Muslims deciding they're the ones that decide what is real Islam. They're the ones who decide what is the reality that the religious reality they're, they're dealing with. Um, and then the third element, which, you know, you have an emergency, you have agency, and then the authenticity that comes with the ISIS identity. What is ISIS, right? It's this grim, austere, rough, tough entity that is brutal. That makes it seem more authentic rather than less, more real. Uh, unlike Al-Qaeda, which promises the caliphate sometime in the future, this is about fulfillment now, also a very modern Western concept. We want our things right now. We don't want them in the future. Um, this, pa this package is very powerful. Since, as I said, since June of 2014, the end of June 2014, when the caliphate was announced, it becomes about building. Building rather than destroying. All too often we focus on the grotesque videos of people being slaughtered, and we somehow draw this fatal misconception of ISIS propaganda that is mostly about brutality. Actually, it is not mostly about brutality. It would be easier if it was. It is mostly about building. It is mostly about the future. You can't make a revolution without breaking some eggs. Look at the rhetoric, look at the, the spirit of the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution. You know, horrific realities that cause mass murder on an industrial scale. And yet, if you look at the beginning, it's all about how wonderful things are, about how a new world is being constructed, how a new reality is being constructed. So this ISIS utopianism is the principal uh, element that you see, especially since the, since the caliphate. It's about building a future rather than destroying, or destroying in order to build a future. Now, the response by Western and Eastern governments has been, uh, to be blunt, inadequate uh, for a variety of reasons. Number one, neither the West nor the East, meaning neither Western governments nor Middle Eastern governments, had a good answer to that initial mobilizing factor that drew, drew people to the, to the conflict, which was Syria. I'm not here to tell you we should have gone to war in Syria, we should not have gone to war, we should kill Bashar al-Assad. To me, that's irrelevant. But what I'm saying is that their narrative is easy to understand, and the counter-narrative is difficult to understand. Uh, we used to see this in the U.S. government in CSCC, where you know we would attack ISIS and people would answer us and say, well, what about Assad? And we would say, well, we don't like Assad, but... That's all we could say, because that was the policy. So from the beginning, you're hamstrung that you could not adequately address the chief point which led to mobilization by thousands of people. The second thing, of course, it's difficult to talk about religion and to formulate a counter-narrative that hits at those bases. If ISIS, if Al-Qaeda is a Salafi jihadist organization, you have to find an argument or a counter-argument to the Salafi jihadist position. You have to address the difficult things of, why not a caliphate? What's wrong with Sharia? What does it mean when you talk about kufr, unbelief, when you talk about that jihad fi sabilillah is not an option for Muslims, but actually a requirement? It's a duty of Muslims. There has to be an answer. Obviously, Western governments are poorly positioned to do that. And all too often, Middle Eastern governments, uh, governments that speak in Arabic, uh, are also poorly, to, uh, poorly positioned. that They haven't wanted to address these things. So there have been worthy but lacking efforts. The Saudis, since 2004, 
began efforts to counter radicalization. Uh, but they've been hampered because it was basically a Wahhabi Salafi answer to a Wahhabi Salafi problem. So they were in this difficult position of saying, we actually agree with the bases of what you're doing, but we don't want you to do what you're doing. Um, you know, a house divided against itself cannot stand, it's a problem. Um, the United Kingdom was, I think, one of the leaders in doing this in the PREVENT program, but that has had... I know there are people from the UK here, and I'll leave that for them, but it's had some challenges as well, and especially in the area of social media. Um, I think this is a problem that you see that it, it's not like the it's been a fair fight, that we put our best and they put our best in the same space. The efforts of governments, both Western and Eastern governments, have been misaligned. The area where they put all their efforts is the area where we put at least of our efforts. All too often we looked at the space through the lens of law enforcement or intelligence work. And those are both very worthy things. But of course, ISIS used it in terms of mobilization, in terms of propaganda. And that's the part that we ignored. So it's kind of, we focused on this, we locked this door and we left that door open. And indeed, they found a niche in the reality that exists in, in social media. If I could just talk about my own country, about the United States, they found this niche that existed or a weakness that existed where three things happened when you look at social media. Number one, the default libertarian attitude of social media companies. Right? The internet is great. Freedom is wonderful. Let a thousand flowers bloom. Number two, the default position of, for example, the U.S. government, I used to be in the U.S. government, which is very similar to that. We don't want to be like the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians who are arresting bloggers and shutting down the Internet. No, we believe in freedom. That's part of what we are. And number three, the default position of law enforcement and the intelligence community, which is that social media is about gathering information about terrorist attacks, about criminal actions. It's not actually about the radicalization process. So that we do nothing to disrupt this radicalization process until actually there's a terrorist plot. Um, so we're basically intervening at a very late part of, of the uh, of, of, the, uh, uh, of the process. Um, like I said, we haven't addressed the heart of the problem, which is, as I described yesterday in my remarks, the motivational framework of what drives this. We focus too much on um, 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 other things, but not on this Salafi jihadist construct, which is what pushes what they're doing. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, I could go on, I have a lot more notes, but I want to give time to my colleagues. But uh, the last point I would leave with you is that we do face the challenge that this has been going on now long enough that the narrative has a logic and a, a, a force of its own. And even if the Islamic State was destroyed tomorrow, which is something very much to be hoped for, it's not going to happen tomorrow, um, the, the way, the ISIS way of doing media has already um, uh, not only metastasized, but also been adopted by others. And initially, when I began a study that's coming out uh, from Brookings uh, in, in a few weeks, initially the other jihadist organizations were not very good in social media. I talked about your grand Al-Qaeda as your grandfather using social media. One of the things that's happened with the rise of ISIS is that they have reacted to that. And you see the branches, you see the Nusra Front and others improving the quality of their media to keep pace with ISIS. Um, in, in the world of jihadist organizations, the weak sister was always, for example, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. Uh, in North Africa, they're very good at kidnapping. They made lots of money in kidnapping, but not very good in social media. But you see in their latest videos, including one released last week, them following the ISIS way of doing things. So the battle is joined. There's a lot to do. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alberto, on the overview that you gave us about the phenomenon. And now we will enter into the national state. Uh, please, 
the Baroness Ekiot play. Yeah, it's very difficult, I can see. Morning, everyone. The, um, the previous speaker mentioned the, um, the the British jihadis who have uh, been um, killed by by a, a drone action the other day, and it reminded me of something which um, is a, a, a particularity of of um, the jihad world, uh, which is that the the Brits seem to feature in it as some of the major communicators of this vile message. Um, there's something I think in the British gene, you know, we, we um, dominate the theater, we take the Oscars in Hollywood, uh, and uh, others of our brethren on the dark side uh, are major communicators of, of uh, uh, jihadi uh, beliefs and, and propaganda. Um, you know, you may have heard of Jihadi John, who uh, you know, is the young man who holds up the, the bags. Speak the, into the I'm so sorry, the bags of heads. Um, I find it, yeah. Okay. It should be in front of your mouth, otherwise it won't work. <laughs> I can't then see my notes. <laughs> so, right, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, did you miss what I was saying? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, I'm. We now turn. I'm afraid from, in a sense, from the excitement to to the the rather grey activities of government and what the hell are we going to do about this. Uh, and the story I'm going to tell um, is one of a rise of capability, uh, increase in our capacity to d deal with the various facets. Uh, ranging from the increase in our technical capabilities, uh, increasing understanding of the political motivation that, lay, that lies behind uh, jihadi activity and our ability to respond to it politically, to a decline in both. A decline in capability, which is uh, worrying and serious, and also, I think, uh, uh, currently, a decline in our ability to respond to the political messaging uh, the ideology that lies behind it. And I agree with what the previous uh, speaker just said about the difficulty that we're having in finding the counter-narrative. So uh, uh, let me tell you a bit about, first of all, the rise, uh, and then we'll get into the current state of affairs. The, uh, I'm going to talk, going to call the first stage, in a sense, what has now, in, uh, looking back on it, really has become sort of conventional terrorism. Uh, that's to say, the sort of terrorism uh, that was introduced by and run by Al-Qaeda of a top-down, well-organized uh, uh, machine. You know, um, and I'm not saying actually that, that uh, uh, ISIS isn't organized. Orga ISIS, ISIS most certainly is organized, but it's organized much more ra laterally. It's not nearly so, uh, nearly so top down, uh, and it doesn't operate its its uh, uh, terrorist campaign uh, in the way that Al Qaeda did. Al Qaeda, in fact, the way it operated its its uh, terrorism, gave government a very great deal of information and leverage uh, in to be able to penetrate and to be able to track what was going on. And of course, they are where well, they were the first to use, and this was a great shock to government. Uh, they were the first to use uh, uh, the internet for communication. Um, and if you think for a moment, here I come from a country you know that's had uh, considerable experience of of terrorism, um, and we thought with the IRA that we knew quite a lot about it. Um, the shock that was delivered to the system, of course. Uh, was the realization that terrorism could be conducted over thousands of miles uh, with uh, planning in one place and execution in another, uh, with funding that came in uh, by means that have already been, uh, been described. 
uh, and that this was a huge international operation. So the scale of the whole thing was something which had to be taken on board. So the very first thing that uh, the services, in, and I'm going to focus for, for a moment on the question of the, the technical response, the intelligence response. Uh, the first thing that uh, had to happen, and the wake-up call, I have to say, really came after 9-11. We were aware, we were aware before that of you know, the terrorist activity was, that was going on, but to a very large extent, it was still felt to be something that was uh, occurred elsewhere. It was a regional manifestation. It was activity that occurred abroad. We had seen uh, some, some very serious attacks on, uh, for instance, the American embassies in Africa, but it hadn't actually hit the Western world. That changed, obviously, with 9-11. With, with so what happened? Huge upscaling of, of investment. Uh, and of effort, huge expansion, had to recruit a large number of people extremely rapidly. Uh, that meant, and what kind of people were we going to recruit? Suddenly we had to have people who actually understood these languages, not a requirement previously. So not only uh, was one actually upscaling extremely fast, and if you can uh, uh, imagine, for, for services, which intelligence services, which had largely operated no, uh, undercover in the shadows of the state, which is no longer true. We all know about our intelligence agencies these days. Um, recruitment used to be conducted rather discreetly in rather small numbers, uh, after very careful examination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And suddenly, one was faced with the need actually to upscale in great, very great numbers. So the the techniques used uh, had to change and. People acknowledged that in doing this, there were risks involved. Would we be recruiting necessarily the right people? Well, we know the story, do we not, of the contractor called Edward Snowden, which is an example, I think, of the effects of upscaling in very, very large numbers and the techniques that you have to use to do that. You end up with some people who uh, are not necessarily going to help you. So it's a, dip, it's a risk. We also obviously had to reorientate uh, the intelligence services. The target was quite different. We didn't know a great deal about the target, so learning about the target uh, was another task. International cooperation between friendly services. Uh, many people in this room will have heard of something called the Five Eyes. That uh, proceeded apace. Why did we need to do this? We needed international cooperation because even for the United States, uh, it was not possible to accumulate the necessary knowledge and coverage you know, in, in, in the rap rapidity with which one needed it. So international cooperation, exchange of information, and also of technique uh, became extremely important. And I would say these days that the relationship that's developed among Five Eyes countries and countries associated with Five Eyes, and that includes uh, Israel, uh, is one of the very important backbones now of how Western influence and Western power uh, is maintained in the world. Uh, we are up against some very formidable challenges, and this is one of our strengths. And it's very important, I think, that we hang on to uh, this, this, uh, very, this close relationship, which, of course, goes to the core also of our uh, related capabilities, including our military capabilities. So one of the things that the intelligence services had to do, and I'm, I'm, there's obviously a limit to what I can say about, uh, about technique, uh, but was to learn how to do two things simultaneously. One, to track what was happening by way of conspiracy. Because what were you trying to do? You were trying to prevent an incident taking place. It's all very well you know, to prosecute people after the event, and that has also become a very important part of policy. You need to be able to deter people from doing it by both prosecuting successfully when something has happened, but also prosecuting for conspiracy before it has happened, also to act as deterrence. But the name of the game, obviously, is prevent these conspiracies uh, getting going. So disruption is what was needed. And, and if you had to choose between disruption in order to prevent something taking place and letting a conspiracy run that was dangerous, uh, 
to the point at which you might have had sufficient evidence for the court, this was a difficult choice because you know, you'd like to have evidence, take it to the court. But if it, that was too dangerous, you had to come in earlier, you had to intervene earlier. One of the great differences between uh, the kind of terrorism we face now, where the object of the exercise is to kill, to kill people and loss of life, uh, as compared with the, our experience with the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, when their object was not to kill, their object was to fear, to introduce fear, introduce disruption, and to bring down the government. But they always warned, or nearly always warned. So loss of life was limited. This is different. These people want to kill. You therefore have to intervene at an early stage. Getting the evidence to go to court is often quite difficult, though we have improved our techniques, I think all of us, all the countries involved, to a very great extent. Uh, and, we, and we now know how to take cases to court, and we have a higher conviction rate than we used to. But as I say, prevention was the game. So how did you prevent? Well, you needed to know what was going on by way of organization among the conspirators. Very often, you know, they would be somewhere in the remote highlands of Wasiristan, and you needed to know what was happening by way of reception and activity taking place on the ground where the target was, whichever country it was. You know, for, for our purposes, you know, the United Kingdom, and how people were joining up together. So you had to do two lots of tracking. It became technically, over time, quite possible with, by, by electronic means, uh, actually, to be able to track uh, the activities of people you know, through their mobile telephones uh, and through other, other means, what was going on in Waziristan. We had a very, we developed a very clear picture we could almost visualize the, their movements as they went from place to place, the way they contacted each other. Uh, so we, over time, began to get a really good grip, a really good grip on the activities of the terrorists so that we, our capacity to intercept and intervene increased very considerably. And I think the, you will hear from uh, people who've been in the intelligence services, and I think this is probably true of uh, um, um, members of American services too, that uh, by the time, uh, just about the time at which we began to see uh, the emergence of, of uh, ISIS and new techniques being adopted, we had begun to have reasonable confidence that actually we had got, got some kind of I wouldn't say grip, but ability to understand and to, to take uh, sufficient precautionary measures to bring down the level of risk uh, uh, significantly. And indeed, the UK for a period was able to lower uh, its uh, alert level, its national alert level. It has now gone up again. Um, so. Uh, there was a feeling of not of, of confidence, I would say, or of, of complacency, but certainly a feeling uh, that uh, we were, you know, we were increasingly in control of our ability to you know, keep the peace, at least in our own country. And we were beginning, as you know, to have also success on the ground uh, through military and other means, actually to dismantle, and finally, of course, behead uh, the organisation. But then, of course, things happened, um, and you know, the, the terrorist story uh, moved on. And ISIS presents a challenge of a quite different kind, combined, I might say, with uh, a change in, obviously, a change in the, the technologies <coughs> and, also, and change in, in use of technologies and uh, development of technologies of a kind uh, which have actually um, uh, significantly reduced the uh, technological advantage that member state or that, that states previously had uh, in combating, um, well, at least in in detecting um, the the activities of of, um, of the various networks. So what's happened? Well, first of all, as we've heard, ISIS has taken to using using much more using uh, social media. It uses the internet, obviously, but its key activity for recruitment and its key activity for propaganda uh, is very much more social media. That is much harder, much harder for intelligence agencies uh, to follow. Why? The technology is different. 
uh, the control of it lies outside. It's not. It's not capable of of, of interception. Uh, uh, for the country like the United Kingdom, uh, the owners of social media lie outside our jurisdiction. We're not able to require them to produce uh, information when we have it. And part of our problem is uh, that uh, we don't get hold of that information. Um, in, 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 in timely manner, uh, and the result is we are dependent on the voluntary cooperation of, um, of the social media owners, which is, I would say, only partly forthcoming. Uh, they have been extremely helpful when it has come to things like um, child abuse, uh, but when it comes to terrorism, it seems to be a problem of freedom of speech, uh, and uh, we don't we don't get the same degree of cooperate, voluntary cooperation. As things stand at the moment, there is no rapid uh, legal method, uh, internationally accepted legal method. The only the only uh, methods we have of getting hold of information are extremely long-winded. If you go via via um, uh, you know, governmental, uh, intergovernmental cooperation. Uh, and so we need some uh, rapid method to be developed, such as the sort of thing that operates in the European Union uh, or for, for um, exchange of, of information and ability, actually, to uh, have a warrant served. Uh, our processes at the moment are extremely slow. So um, there, is a, there, there is a jurisdictional problem uh, and there is a problem, therefore, for uh, governments to get hold of of both uh, information and of uh, evidence that they need uh, for you know, dealing with some of, some of these cases. So that is one one quite big quite big problem. The more serious problem, however, I would regard as being uh, the whole question of the uh, one to one messaging that is now being pumped by um, by ISIS. Um, and we've heard about it, and it's extremely, it's extremely exciting to those who are listening. Uh, the average age of, of those being recruited to terrorism has gone down by about 10 years. Um, it used to be people in their mid-20s, late-20s. Uh, it's now people as young as 14, uh, very, very young teenagers, extraordinarily impressionable. Um, the material for for men, some of it is quite brutal. Uh, I know there is uplift and there is, you know, stuff about about uh, the ideal society as well. But a lot of it actually is uh, is the excitement of of gore and and blood. Uh, there's a quite different technique being used with girls, uh, of which I think resembles for me an appeal to the sort of religious ecstasy that young girls can feel at a certain <coughs> stage of their, you know, of their lives, of their, their you know, sacrifice and their willingness to, to uh, you know, lead saintly lives. Um, and you know, they're encouraged to think that um, going out and marrying and, and being part of uh, this, great, uh, this great new world uh, is the destiny that they should follow. And it, it's, it's extraordinarily effective. Uh, to, to young women who've got uh, cosmetics in their bag, go to the f cinema, um, 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 are um, you know, reaching, reaching the last stages of their education, um, uh, free to travel, um, no, lead a really rich and amusing life. Um, and this, uh, this message uh, appears to have extremely uh, effective um, 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 resonance, uh, and they go off in they go off in groups. That's the other thing you notice. They tend not to go alone. They go off in groups. Increasingly, this is something where we do it together, and they communicate these messages to each other, and they encourage each other in the notion that this will, this is this will be a really really interesting thing to do. Um, so um, that is why one has seen, I think, you know, uh, four or five girls go off together. And this has certainly been happening in the UK. Whole families, um, women taking, mothers taking their children. Um, extraordinary, extraordinary. Um, and very, very difficult. Where is the counter-narrative? Where is the counter-narrative? Um, 
I think in response to what was said, and I agree with what was said about the appeal of the message, I think the single, uh, the single counter that is most powerful, most powerful, is the, is the testimony of the ex-jihadi. The chap who's been through it, knows how bad it is, knows how fraudulent it is, and is willing, to, willing and able to put that into language, uh, which you know, really does actually uh, strike home with, with the audience. But this has to be done, you know, often on a one-to-one -one basis. The numbers of people that we have involved doing it are very few. Uh, so we're fighting, you know, a big, a big swathe of propaganda with a very, very small number of people who are likely to have any effect. We are doing it. Uh, we're putting quite a lot of this stuff onto YouTube. Um, it's not something in the end I think the government can do. Certainly not the agent, the direct agents of government can't do it. Uh, we can help finance it, uh, but we somehow have to find a way of scaling up. Otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere near. Uh, the audience that we need at the, in the time that we needed. I said that the other thing that was uh, was uh, worrying about the situation is our decline in our decline in technical uh, advantage. Um, <laughs> the, the use of encryption is becoming a very serious problem for for government agencies, um, and we don't have answers to that yet. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, as partly as a result of Snowden. Uh, there is now center stage uh, a very a, 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 a growth in distrust, which has not been the case previously, between I think populations and 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 governments about government use of information, acquisition of information, and uh, the British government has to bring some legislation to Parliament next year um, or late this year uh, to uh, enable it to to uh, collect. Uh, data uh, in bulk, um, and also to maintain its its what technological advantage it has in various respects. This is going to be a very difficult battle, because the um, I think that uh, the, the specter of of bulk collection is is uh, interpreted as uh, implying that government is engaged in bulk surveillance of society. Not true, but widely believed. Uh, and the distrust that can develop over this, um, you know, undermines the confidence that people have uh, in the activities of government and the methods by which it, that it has to use to uh, protect people. Uh, this is this is very corrosive in democracy, and it's very important that we help each other in restoring, I think, uh, confidence in in technique. So. We have, I think, uh, some problems now uh, by way of and I, and what I've described, I think, by way of, of decline in relative of capability is not unique to the UK. I think it is, it is wider than that. Um, and we have, I think, uh, a further issue to, to take into account for the future. The name of the game so far, you know, for terrorism has been destruction, disruption of systems, but destruction. Um, there is a future kind of terrorism, I think, which we need to think about and we need to start planning against. Much more likely to take place, I think, in the context of, of, of people engaged and sponsored by governments, by states, but not necessarily. Um, and that is actually not uh, destroying your or disrupting your systems or destroying your life. It is taking control, taking control of systems taking control of the medical device, taking control of, uh, of a weapon system, taking control of a, a vital part of, a, of, say, a power grid, uh, and using it for the purposes. In the world of the Internet of Things, as we already know, this is, this is not already happening, that you take control. People are worried about the extent to which, when somebody has a pacemaker, that somebody can actually take control of it and alter its setting. Similarly, you know, we know about the ability to take control of, a, of, a, of a, an automatic, of um, an electronic car. This is, I mean, it lies, fortunately, still in the future, but I don't think it's fanciful. And I think that in the world of hybrid warfare that has now come to stay, 
where you will get conventional activity combined with unacknowledged, unadmitted, but nevertheless sponsored activity taking place of a kind uh, where you know, tracking, tracking who's done it, let alone rectifying what they've done, is going to become a very serious problem. And I regard uh, um, taking control as being a more serious threat to us than disruption of our systems, difficult as recovery may in the future be. So my message is, is um, um, one of extreme caution at the moment. I haven't gone into, because I talked about it yesterday, the, uh, some of the policies that we, we have developed and need to develop uh, on the human level to deal with, with the motivation behind uh, um, terrorism and uh, what was referred to, and I agree with it, that actually uh, extremism and tackling extremism was a very important part of dealing with, with, uh, with, with both um, preventing people getting into into a terrorist frame of mind, but also uh, uh, de-radicalize them uh, uh, after the event. Uh, but I think that uh, we need to be as concerned now about our capacity to actually deal with the technical challenges that uh, terrorist activity uh, confronts us with as we need to be concerned about the human response to it as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. By uh, sharing with us some of the challenges, difficulties, problems that we need to deal on the national level. And now please the commissioner <laughs> come to uh, continue the story of the national level. Now I feel less safe, you know. How are you? Keeping away? Good. Uh, I'm feeling a bit disheveled this morning. I sort of left the hotel, had a jacket and tie, until I came in contact with the Herzliya atmosphere, which destroyed me. Um, and I left all those things behind. Uh, in, in London, we would call this sort of heat a weapon of mass destruction. You know, <laughs> we're just not used to it too much. I understand the sand came in from Syria, is that right? <laughs> I'm not sure why they invested in all those rockets when they could have just dumped this everywhere around the world. You know, it's pretty heavy stuff. So we're not used to this heat. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a few things. I'm going to touch on a couple of the speakers' bits. Let me explain a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, City of London Police, we're a small force in the centre of London. Uh, we police counter-terrorism with the rest of London, the Metropolitan Police, but most importantly, we are the collation and analytical centre for everything to do with fraud and cybercrime for the whole of the UK. So we have people embedded in all the agencies, GCHQ, MI5 and MI6. We work very closely with the private sector and the banks. So we have a good sort of sight and picture, I suppose, of some of the cyber threats facing society. And there's a few statements I'm going to make as I run through the slides. I'm going to give you a feel for fraud. And, and you need to know a little bit about fraud for two reasons. Not because of fundraising, which I'll touch on, but because the answer to the attack threat we face from cyber, which we've yet to really see, as we saw earlier on. You know, we talked a lot about social media and the supporting networks for cyber, but the attack methodology, the vector, isn't there. That defense will come through our working with the private sector. And to understand that, you need to understand cybercrime. So that's one statement for you. In terms of social media and support networks, there is a very big issue for us with encryption at the moment. Um, and I speak not as a politician. UK police chiefs are not politicians. We're appointed. We come up through the service for, in my case, 32 years. So we speak our mind. Uh, and it's about time that Western countries started to grapple with encryption and some of the social media companies, and indeed the very internet in our society for all its good and the damage it is also bringing as well. That's my little soapbox piece out of the way for you. Fraud. How many of you in the room have experienced uh, a fraud in your bank account or in your bank card? We admit it, are we in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know yet. About one in three in the room, something like that? Okay, what other crime type would you get that response from in any group anywhere in the world? Nothing. 
That's the scale of cyber crime in society today. And countries are not grappling with it because they're not aware of it. Because traditional forms of government approaching this are through reported crime. And 90% of this crime is not going through the systems anywhere in the world. We see some figures up here, 2.78 trillion. UK, we know pretty certainly the, the, the actual financial cost to us in the UK through cyber-enabled fraud is about £50 billion a year, getting on for a third of the UK deficit. No idea what that is in the US because nobody records the figure. It has to be extrapolated and you need to do some data sampling to get there. Probably about $500 billion US dollars a year lost through cyber fraud. That's a large amount. And the reason it's not getting reported is because 90% of it is going through the financial sector and they're not reporting it to the UK. Huge increase. We've only got a quarter of a million crimes being recorded. We know through our crime survey there's three million crimes in our society. So we can show you some evidence to say it's 90% underreported. It's very large. 90% of all organisations except they've been breached last year. 90% of all organisations except they've been breached. Well, how do they know? Well, mainly because they've been defrauded. They have no idea of the espionage and state capability that's breached them already. Probably nearly every organisation has been breached in some way. Every stock exchange has been breached as well. So you sort of need to understand the scale of this that's going on to understand how weak our internet is for our society. And that is where the attack vector will come from, from terrorism. That's the link. We know the nature of the threat, don't we? Espionage, military, hacktivists, terrorists, criminals. This is a big one. Organised crime is global in this space at the moment, and it is growing exponentially. It's getting more sophisticated every year. It's growing every year. We have over 50 countries targeted in the UK in cyber-related crime. 70% of all fraud in the UK is cyber-enabled. 50% of all fraud is coming international. The traditional law enforcement approach of target and enforcement is never going to work in this space. The attacks are coming from countries we have no extradition with. We can't control the internet. You cannot deploy a normal pursue enforcement approach in this space. We haven't got the intelligent coverage in these countries. The only answer for society to deal with the cyber aid of crime is through the private sector. It is through the information <laughs> assurance processes <laughs> It's through internet service providers. It's through banks and the financial sector. And you're quite right from the previous speaker, it's the SME businesses that create the biggest threat for us when we get into terrorism as well. Something to bear in mind up here on espionage and military. The people who create the back doors in our systems globally are spies. The biggest malware <coughs> hacks in our internet at the moment, used by international criminals, the majority have been morphed from state espionage capability. We've got to have a serious conversation if we want to protect society with those who are using the internet to actually attack or do espionage as well. And it's an interesting challenge you don't often see going on in governments at the moment. The growth in society, the internet of things, the infrastructure, we can know this. We know what's going on. It's the digitization beyond the front end of a business that's bothering us more and more. And we haven't seen attack methodology yet with terrorism. But as you move beyond the front end of an organization to say systems can be controlled, complete life support systems in major hospitals, or your transport infrastructure, things that control aircraft, can all be controlled digitally. That's the increasing threat we face. And not all of this is sitting within our critical national infrastructure, being nicely protected by our certs, our governments across the countries. Only a small proportion is. So the attack vector is opening up. And the capability of criminals and terrorists is increasing. And it's an, un, you know, it's an uncomfortable gap we see emerging. Talked about the limitations of response. International technological governments can't do much in this space at the moment. They can't just throw legislation at it. They can't throw money at it. They can't grapple with this they can, the way they can most things. Let's just take a departure down a bit of a cul de sac to look at fraud a second. That's our specialty in the City of London Police. We're carrying about 
500 investigations at the moment amounted to about £5 billion pounds worth of fraud. Huge numbers, huge scale. We've got close connectivity in London across many agencies. But it's an interesting fact, isn't it, that nearly 50% of all the terrorists in the UK have been tracked, found and prosecuted for fraud. Now, we face a very different sort of scale of threat and capability in Europe than here in the Middle East, of course, and around the Middle East, shall I say. We've got the lone actor. That's the big challenge for us, as you know, across Europe. But all of those loan actors are seeking to fund their activity themselves. And it's fraud that they use, which I'll come on to in a second. Most of them are involved in claiming benefits and also <coughs> defrauding those benefits. So the people involved in work and pensions, the people who give you benefits, tax, revenue, those are the areas that are rich in intelligence for countries to start to understand more. <coughs> The fraud is described very much in terrorist ma manuals. So I'll just give you a couple of case examples down the bottom. Examine was uh, these three individuals here who were intent on planting eight rucksack bombs across London. They were defeated because uh, of intelligence plus information coming in about their fraudulent activity. They were seeking to gather the money to fund their operation. And that was simply charity collections on the street, fraudulent charity collections bigger one, an organised crime gang that was specifically sending money to support terrorism abroad was a cash for cash, we call it in the UK. So this is where people organise accidents and then claim large amounts of money from insurance companies, but supported by corrupt medical practitioners and lawyers as well. Specific organised crime gang, all focused on gathering money to support jihadists abroad. The reason I mention all this is how we start to think about intelligence differently. We're in a landscape now where I suppose the world's changing from a very structured <laughs> history to something where the infrastructure is not so explicit when you look at countries like the US and Europe in particular. Different in other parts of the world, I accept. We have encryption. We have, I think, less intelligence coverage than we ever used to have. We have less command structures to run down to find where the terrorists are, and more lone actors and inspired by ideology. So we need to have a better intelligence coverage. We need to look closely about how people who are lone actors are seeking to fund themselves, because that is the bottom-up way of identifying it. And law enforcement and agencies traditionally only look at this space after they've identified the suspect for a means of prosecuting them. My suggestion back in here is we want to start looking at the fraudulent means of gathering money as a means of identifying the terrorist in the first instance. I'll come back to that in my last slide, but just a few things that we know about. PBX hacking, this is your phone's corporate phone lines, had some massive back doors in them in terms of malware. You could hack them and then start pushing out international calls globally against the cost of the corporate firm. You could charge it out and nobody knew. You can make hundreds of thousands of dollars at it. And we know that ISIS-inspired terrorists have been using that methodology through hacks that have been inspired through Palestine, other places, where you've got clear fundraising through malware attacks. Website to face, we've spoken about social media attacks as well. The cyber terrorism bit, I, I'm, you know, what keeps me awake at night, if you like, is that we have a lot of problems in the UK. We have lone actors and we're targeting those people and we are trying our best to keep our intelligence coverage going in some challenging times. The biggest threat that bothers me is the shift of capability into cyber attack through ISIS-inspired and ISIL-funded capability. So exactly, Colonel, that slide shift that I think could move very quickly with the amount of funding that's available now to translate or translate um, state capability, if you like, into ISIS. And, and that attack planning, if it gets into digital areas like uh, transport infrastructure in particular is an area we know that ISIS have focused on in the past. It bothers me a lot. Uh, and looking closely at how all transport infrastructures are becoming more digital uh, concerns me. 
to the point where I've made statements to the press to say that we will experience something not dissimilar to a 9-11 in cyber in the next few years. It will come. And I'm bothered that governments aren't doing enough to protect in that space. So what can we do? It's my last slide, because I know you'll be tired, you want coffee, you want to stretch your legs, you want so many things at the moment. I know, I know, and I can see it in your eyes. I'm suffering with you, I know. <laughs> Once they, they still need to suffer. They suffer? Okay. <laughs> okay, suffer. We'll just, you know. We might have to do a bit of one of those stand-up motions in a minute and sort of say hello to your neighbour and things like that. What can we do about any of these things I've spoken about? It's my last slide, so you know you're sort of moving away from me. <laughs> You know, there's, a, there's always got to be a takeaway, hasn't there, from, I think, these presentations. I've sort of covered the areas I've covered in the slides here. Just think about the information that we can get from banks in particular about fraud that could be terrorist-related. So we have a very good system in the UK, a National Terrorist Financial Investigation Unit. It's a multi-agency unit. It has our government departments who give benefits in it as well as law enforcement. But we worked very closely with the entire banking sector in the UK to try to develop something very similar to SARS regime. So those of you who know what suspicious activity reporting is in banks, it's a very clear mandatory requirement for money laundering. It's a regulatory requirement everywhere. You don't have that regulatory requirement for indicators to do with terrorist financing. So what we're trying to do is build a voluntary code within Britain where the financial sector start giving us the indicators of terrorist financing. But it would be an interesting point to where, where that government should be thinking about regulating in that space. We need to make people more aware of terrorist financing. Innocent people, governments, NGOs, charities. We need to raise a campaign to understand what the telltale signs are, because you can tell people and they can report it to you. When we get into the cyberspace, this protection is the piece I say to governments all the time in relation to cyber-related fraud, and it's an uncomfortable message to ministers and politicians to say, you can't solve this, minister. You know, it doesn't matter how big you are, how much money you've got, it'd be the same in the White House as well, you will not solve cybercrime. You just won't. The only people who are going to solve this are the private sector. That is telecoms. ISPs, financial institutions, how do you grapple with that as a government? Well, one of the things you've got to do is get information standards pushed into the regulatory space at government level to mandate requirements of information security <coughs> across the world, across Western countries. By doing that, we'll get ahead of the curve of the attack methodology that isn't here yet. But we have got to move into that space quickly to start making sure the information is secure. We need a better engagement, I would suggest, with military and espionage, who are pretty good at spying and attacking, with those who have got to protect society as well. And that's an uncomfortable discussion to have, probably, across government levels. We've got to build our CERT. This is cabinet, uh, sorry, computer emergency response teams. Every country's got one. They're pretty good. They've built up their capability, but they're very focused on just a, a narrow critical national infrastructure at the moment. And I think we need to broaden that out into SMEs and other businesses as well in most countries. But information security standards is one of the biggest things we need to work to do right, to stop that curve ahead of it, you know, a couple of years ahead of it at the moment. If you think we, ISIS haven't got the capability at the moment. We have time to make the systems that are their attack vector secure. But we haven't got long. We've only got maybe a year or so. That's my show. Thanks very much, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner, that you opened our eyes regarding uh, problems of crime. And you ignite, ignite our imagination with the coffee. But we need... <laughs> but, but we need to suffer for 40 minutes from now and we will have the, the coffee because I want to uh, invite my friends to describe the international uh, connection. Please. Thank you, Eitan, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, Commissioner, 
where are you? Thank you so much for setting up the audience with such a, <laughs> such a plum. So now the burden, uh, it was hard enough, uh, the acts before me were hard enough to follow, now it's even more difficult to keep everybody on track. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here and I want to thank uh, very much the Stern family for their sponsorship of the day and, and their strategic sponsorship of this place. Um, the topic for the next quarter of an hour, where's my clicker? It deals with the international law perspective on cyber terrorism, which is a little bit of a different space. Although, uh, as much as we've heard so far how difficult it is to cope uh, in terms of the legal tools that are at our disposal with this entire phenomenon, the last two pre presenters really uh, d d did a good service for me in terms of bringing the questions about how we do better in regulating and accessing information on the internet um, into play globally. So we're going to talk about the little, that a little bit. Uh, we're going to touch upon the major developments in two, at two levels. First of all, the development of global norms um, to deal with the challenging task of defining terrorism and cyber terrorism specifically. And more to the point, perhaps, the development of enforcement mechanisms globally. You talked a little bit about CERT. We heard about CERTs uh, a slide and a half ago. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the international arrangements that are currently being developed, perhaps a step behind, but in sync, as, as much in sync as possible with the developments we've heard about earlier. So start off with know thy enemy. Know thine enemy. How many lawyers in the room? Okay. Know thine enemy. Know thyself. Excuse me? How many people with a law degree in the room is even more difficult? How many international lawyers? Sir, uh, the coffee's downstairs, but uh, welcome, welcome your question. So, uh, we've heard a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of examples of cyber terrorism and uh, the challenges of dealing with this phenomenon over the past uh, hour and a half or so. Um, what I'd like to start with is the most interesting develop internationally in the past year, I think, which dovetails exactly with the content of this particular session, which is cyberterrorism communication. So in the wake of the dramatic uptake, we're in the form of the, uh, the United Nations Security Council. In the, in the wake of uh, the varying hostile terrorist activity that we've seen on the internet, uh, the United Nations, for the first time at the level of the Security Council, has in the past year decided to engage in a way it's never engaged before with the phenomenon of terrorist use of the internet. And it's done so not once, but three times. Um, the first effort in terms of Security Council resolutions, which are binding on states and call them to action, was a year ago. Here's some of the wording. We're going to have a few more words on the screen, so bear with me as far as that's concerned. That's what lawyers do. We use words, bandy them about. Um, in responding to terrorist use, hostile, ter hostile use of the internet in general, and terrorist use of the internet specifically, the Security Council, again, which has not engaged with this issue at all up until now, said specifically that the, increase, the increasing concern over use by terrorists of the internet requires country to act cooperatively, you can see it for yourself, to prevent them from exploiting technology, that's the preventive piece, and to actively take steps together globally at an international level to prevent further use. So this, the most specific example we have of this, and we all know about this from the headlines at least, if not uh, at a deeper level, is for example, tracking travel of the uh, uh, potential jihadis into problematic areas of the world. Five, six years ago, this kind of tracking of personal travel didn't happen. So several countries, France is one of the leaders, has already decided on legislation to start looking at these tracking, tra tracking personal travel as a result of some, also as a result of Security Council resolutions. Now, again, the reason that this kind of a development is such a game changer, is such a game changer, is that we haven't seen legal engagement on a global level with terrorist activity on the internet until now. The reason that this is happening is to start to try to close the gap. Decision makers, uh, international legal thinkers, are trying to close the gaps that we've heard about this morning, the only way they know how, which is with the legal toolbox. 
Okay, so not only do we have a game changer in terms of the change in the international community, legal communities thinking about this, we're also going to see in the next few minutes that um, despite the confusion caused at many levels uh, by the hostile use of the internet by, by terrorists and by others, um, a lot of people are looking for a good way out by sharpening the tools in the toolbox and one of these tools for coping with the problem is international law. So we have three issues here. What's the international law challenge our, uh, regarding our cyber terrorism? Who's trying to resolve it now and how are they trying to do that? And what are the current enforcement challenges? We've heard a little bit about that. We're going to focus on a few of them. Um, first of all, the challenge. We've heard already about this difficult, difficult issue for democracies especially. How do we resolve this clash between our deeply held values, not being cynical, deeply held val values that define Western democratic countries in many, many ways, about the freedom of communication. It's a human right, but beyond human right, it defines our societies in so many ways. This clashes with national security concerns. We know this. And then we end up with questions like, is this man a hero or is he a traitor? Many of us are undecided. I know uh, one day I wake up and I, f I figure he's a hero for the Western world, and on other days I'm not sure. Another issue that we've heard about, for the for, a difficult issue for the lawyers, is that hostile uses of the internet can be difficult to distinguish from one another. And I think of this as a sort of a bell curve. So of all hostile uses on the internet, I would put sort of roughly cyber warfare here, cyber terrorism here at the low points of the bell curve. Okay, cyber warfare and ter cyber terrorism. I'm going to be really clear about my thinking on this. We haven't seen cyber warfare yet. We haven't seen cyber terrorism yet in terms of actual physical outcomes. Uh, I like the way you described it, Ambassador, as the foyer to terrorism. That's the way international lawyers think about this. Until we have, as we'll see in some of the definitions, a physical outcome, we're not really talking about terror the way that international law thinks about terror and in the, in the way that domestic legal systems think about terror in most countries. So those are the ends of the bell curve. And as we get towards the middle of the bell curve, we have cyber espionage, cyber crime, excuse me, cyber espionage, cyber attacks. We'll see how they're defined. And then at the top, cyber crime, which we've seen pervasive, ubiquitous. We've all suffered, we've all likely uh, suffered from it. So, Similar techniques across targets. How do we distinguish? How do we distinguish on the one hand between the use of the internet by terrorists, and we've heard a lot about how it's important to front load the legal addressing of potential terrorist activity before it actually comes into a terrorist attack with physical consequences. I agree with that. And uh, the distinction between these actual attacks. Well, we're not the only ones who are confused. Sony incident, we're all familiar with it. We're going to hear from the President of the United States about his confusion. So here are the two adversaries. Uh, a CNN interview with President Obama right after the Sony event came to light. Let's hope this is going to work. You're helping me on this, right? Go back. A minute and 10 seconds from President Obama. No, I don't think it was an act of war. I think it was an uh, act of beginning. cyber vandalism that was very costly. I think so, this was an act of war by North Korea. No, I don't think it was an act of war. I think it was an uh, act of cyber vandalism that vandalism. was very costly, very expensive. We take it very seriously. Uh, we will respond proportionally, as I said. But, uh, you know, we're going to be in an environment in this new world where so much is digitalized that. Uh, both state and non-state actors are going to have the capacity to disrupt our lives in all sorts of ways. We have to do a much better job of guarding against that. I was pretty sympathetic to the fact that they've got business considerations they've got to they've got to make. And you know, had they talked to me directly about this decision, uh, I might have called the movie theaters the chains the and distributors and asked them. Uh, what the story was. But what I was laying out was a principle that I think this country has to abide by. We believe in free speech. We believe in uh, the right of artistic expression and satire and things that powers that be might not like. And if we set a precedent 
in which uh, a dictator in another country can disrupt uh, through cyber, uh, you know, a company's distribution chain or its products, and as a consequence, we start censoring ourselves. That's a problem. Okay, so besides the fact that two, I have two issues with the CNN interview. Number one, that President Ob Obama, uh, and I, I voted for him, I think he's terrific, thinks that this is a future problem, that we will have problems in cyberspace. Someone's got to, should have corrected him on that. We're well into this uh, problematic uh, phase. And number two, that he has time to call movie theaters uh, sometime during the day. But the real issue that we're trying to get out at here is the confusion in our thinking about how we define a cyber terrorist act. So is it cyber vandalism, the Sony attack? Is it cyber disruption? Uh, we have newspapers talking about serious security matters, counterattack at the beginning, you'll remember and recall. Uh, we, talked, uh, we heard from the White House about cyber warfare. Um, the reason that we're so confused about a lot of these issues in terms of the international law, thinking on it is that uh, well, three of the reasons there are many reasons number one we're really vulnerable the exacerbated exacerbated vulnerability of our critical infrastructure systems of our personal 